Little Johnny's mother told him that he had to come straight home from school because he had an appointment with the dentist. Now, Johnny didn't want to go to the dentist, but he heard his mother loud and clear. Three o'clock that day, elementary school gets out. Johnny's mother's at home. She's waiting for Johnny. 3.15, no Johnny. 3.30, no Johnny. 3.45, no Johnny. 4 o'clock, no Johnny. She's starting to get a little worried. She calls the dentist. She has to cancel the appointment. 4.15, no Johnny. 4.30, no Johnny. Finally, quarter till five, Johnny walks in the door. And his mother says, where have you been? I've been worried sick. I had to cancel the dentist appointment. Johnny said, Mom, I have had an incredible adventure coming home from school. She said, well, what happened? He said, well, I was walking along, and I was about a block away from school when all of a sudden, right out of the bushes, a, a giant tiger jumped out at me, and he was ferocious, Mom. I mean, his eyes were big, and he was growling. He started chasing me, and I ran. I ran all the way down Main Street. I took a left, and, and I started to run down Elm Street, and he's still chasing after me. And so I thought, I'm going to cut through the alley. And, and then at the end of the alley, all of a sudden, a giant elephant comes out, and he's blocking my way, so I'm stuck in the alley, and, and the tiger's coming right up to me, and he was about to pounce on me, but I, I looked around and I saw this stick, and, and I, I picked up the stick, and boom, I hit the tiger right on his snout with the stick, and well, it must have startled him, because he ran away, and I was still scared, so I hid inside of a garbage can, and I put the lid over the top, and, and I waited till I was absolutely sure that that elephant and the tiger was gone, and, and then I came home. That's what happened. And she looked at him and she said, do you expect me to believe that story? And he said, Mom, I can prove it to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is true. I have the proof. Look, here's the stick. <laughs> now, I start that way because here, here is what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to talk about this issue of the origin of life. Is creationism the answer? Is evolution the answer? Have scientists really built a convincing case for evolution? Or are they merely waving a stick? In other words, evolutionists have made sweeping claims about the origin and the development of life, but are those assertions really backed up by the evidence, or do the facts point more compellingly toward God? More and more scientists, I'm not talking about theologians, I'm talking about scientists, are saying that the case for evolution is merely a bunch of stick-waving. Assertions that are not really supported by the weight of the evidence. One author wrote, A few years ago, biologists in many institutions would have been putting their careers at risk if they had criticized Darwinism openly but now it's almost fashionable to do so. Biochemist Michael Behe of Lehigh University is among the scientists who concluded that the evolutionary theory has failed based on scientific evidence. Listen to what he said, quote, we are left with no substantive defense against what feels to be a strange conclusion that life was designed by an intelligent agent, end quote. Friends, this is more than just an in-house squabble. A lot is hanging on the issue of whether God is behind creation or whether, as some people sincerely believe, that human beings have evolved over millions of years from a warm pond of non-living chemicals. Philip Johnson, who wrote a little book that is fantastic years ago called Darwin on Trial. Years back, Darwin was debating an evolutionist by the name of William Provine, and it was Provine, the evolutionist, who quite readily conceded that if evolution were true, then there are five inescapable conclusions. Number one, there is no evidence for God if evolution is true. Number two, there is no life after death. Number three, there is no ultimate foundation for what is right and what is wrong. 
Number four, there is no ultimate meaning or purpose in life. And number five, if evolution is true, people don't really have any free will. This is what the evolutionist conceded were the implications of evolution, and these are the implications of what our children are taught every single day in school in America. Listen to the opening words of our Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if that is true, then there are some major implications from that. The Bible says that we as human beings are literally engraved with the image of God, which means that we have tremendous intrinsic value. We have a purpose to life, which is to enter into a personal relationship with God, to love him and to serve others. We have ethical guidelines to live by. We have a sense of right and wrong that is based on the ultimate standard of a holy God. And we have a hope of spending eternity with God in heaven. So this is no idle debate. A lot of this hangs in the balance. I know that there are people that genuinely have questions about this particular topic. And they want thoughtful and serious answers, not bumper sticker quotes. So let's begin by looking at the evidence by defining right off the bat exactly what it is that we mean when we say, or when I say, evolution. Because there, actually there are two very different kinds. The first type is not controversial at all. It is called microevolution, and it refers basically to the variation within a particular species. In other words, we know that there are more than 200 varieties of dogs. We know that cows can be bred for improved milk production. We know that bacteria can adapt and develop immunity to antibiotics. The important thing, though, is that this variation is always within the same kind of animal. For instance, if you try to breed beyond certain boundaries, if, for instance, you, you mate a horse with a donkey, you get a mule. And the offspring are unwilling or unable to reproduce. So over the centuries, science has observed great stability. And that is the line I believe with biblical, or that is in line with biblical teaching. The Bible says that God created plants and animals to reproduce after their own kind, and they do. Microevolution is not controversial at all. But what is controversial is macroevolution, which is the theoretical transformation of one species into another. This is Darwin's idea that without any intelligence guiding its primitive animals, they have transformed over time into more complex species. This theory says that life started millions of years ago when electrical disturbances caused reactions among lifeless chemicals of a primitive ocean, and eventually this caused some of the chemicals to link together and become organized into living cells. All of this, by the way, by chance. And then these organisms mutated over time to develop the various multi-celled plants and animals we see today. This theory says that natural selection helped animals and plants to evolve. Natural selection is merely the idea that organisms that are well suited to their environment will flourish and organisms that are ill suited to their environment will disappear. And over millions of years, says the theory, Various species developed with increasing complexity until human beings came on the scene with the same common ancestor as the ape. As one current biology textbook tells our children in the Des Moines Metro, quote, you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms, end quote. Well, evolutionists insist that all of this is an unguided process. In fact, 
the 1995 official policy statement of the National Association of Biology Teachers calls evolution, quote, an unsupervised, impersonable, unpredictable natural process, end quote. In other words, there is no room for God. But this is this where the evidence really points, or are the evolutionists merely waving a stick? What I want to do is I want to put Darwinism up to two very important tests. And these tests will demonstrate how evolution fails and how I believe God prevails. And I'm not even going to present the most irrefutable evidence of all, which is this, the Chicago Cubs. The Chicago Cubs are the biggest argument against evolution. Because if evolution were true... Certainly by now, they would have won the World Series. Do you know the last time when they went, won the World Series? 1908. That is four years before the Titanic sank. Most teams have rebuilding, a rebuilding year. It's been 107 years. Back when Harry Carey was alive, he parked his car and he accidentally left two Chicago Cubs tickets right there on the dash. They were front row seats, plain view, locked his car, walked away. Sure enough, while he was gone, somebody came, broke into his vehicle, and left two more Cubs tickets on his dash. <laughs> All right, so let's begin with a more serious examination of evolution by applying the first of the two tests that we're going to look at. The first test, the origin of life test. An increasing number of scientists are concluding that it is just plain impossible for non-living chemicals, keep in mind what I'm saying, non-living chemicals to somehow have linked together and to have become organized into the first living cell. Darwin theorized that life began with reactions in what he called a warm pond of chemicals. And this was easier to believe in Darwin's day because back then there didn't appear to be much of a big leap between non-living chemicals and the most basic one-cell organism. After all, when Darwin looked through a primitive microscope that only magnified two or three hundred times, what he saw when he looked at a single-cell organism looked pretty uncomplicated. That's why he called them Simple, quote-unquote, simple one-cell organisms. But today, thanks to advanced technology, we know that even the most basic one-cell organism is incredibly complex. In fact, it is more complicated than anything the greatest scientist and the smartest supercomputer can actually duplicate. Actually, single-cell organisms are high-tech factories on a microscopic level, complete with artificial languages and decoding systems with central memory banks that store and retrieve impressive amounts of information, with precision control systems that regulate the automatic assembly of components with proof reading and quality control mechanisms that safeguard against errors with assembly systems that use principles of prefabrication and modular construction and a complete replication system that allows the organism to duplicate itself at astonishing speed. Friends, Darwin was clearly wrong. A single cell organism is anything but simple. And the more scientists uncover its mind-blowing intricacy and complexity, the more outlandish it seems that non-living chemicals could accidentally link together to form it. Blind chance is an incredibly inefficient way to accomplish anything complex. Imagine I'm holding a hat, and imagine I put in the hat 26 Scrabble tiles. Each tile has one letter of the alphabet, A through Z. Just to demonstrate how incredibly random chance is, 
at being so terribly efficient, inefficient if we were to mix up the tiles, how long do you think it would take us to blindly reach in and spell the word evolution? Nine letters in that word. First you pick until you actually get an E. You put it back. The next one has to be a V. You have to spell it out that way. Picking one tile a minute. How long do you think it would take? Think it would take an hour? A day? A week? Just to spell the nine-letter word evolution at one tile a minute by blind chance would take you 9,600,000 years. That's a long time. And if you wanted to, by blind chance, pick out the word construction, a 12-letter word at one tile a minute, it would take you a thousand million years years on average to do that. That is how terribly inefficient random process and blind chance is at accomplishing anything complex. In a similar way, how long do you think it would take to randomly link together the building blocks of life? Well, let's go back to some basics of biology and remember that living cells are built with protein molecules and Protein molecules are built with hundreds of amino acid links. In all, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids, some of which are lethal. So if we ignore the question of where the amino acids come from in the first place, and we eliminated the deadly ones, and we gave every possible opportunity for these amino acids to actually link up, how long do you think it would take for the hundreds of amino acids necessary to form one protein molecule to link together by random process? Do you think it would take a long time? It would. In fact, the number is so astronomical that if I told you the number, we wouldn't be able to grasp how big it is. So I have to use an analogy to let you know how long it would take to form one protein molecule by random processes. You start with an ant. And this ant is a very slow ant. It takes this ant 15 billion years to walk one inch. This is not a fast ant. And it's not a very strong ant either because this this ant can only carry one atom at a time. You know how small an atom is. An atom is so small it takes a million atoms lined up to equal the width of a human hair. So here's the question. Even going one inch in 15 billion years carrying one atom at a time, how many atoms could that ant carry and how far could he carry them in the amount of time that it would take on the average for one protein molecule to form by random processes through what we've been describing? Well, even at that incredibly slow speed, that ant would be able to carry 600,000 trillion, trillion, trillion galaxies the size of our galaxy and carry them 30 billion light years and the amount of time it would take for one protein molecule to form by random processes. That's a long time. And you know what? It doesn't give us life. It just gives us one single, solitary, lonely, non-living bachelor protein molecule. And it takes 239 protein molecules of various kinds to come together in the correct order to form a basic living cell. Do you know how long it would take through random processes to accomplish that? So let's be rational. Darwin fails the origin of life test. But but the flip side of that is the very evidence of life in all of its intricacy, all of its molecular complexity points, I believe, very powerfully to a creator. So let's look at one more test. The fossil test. When Darwin formulated his theory in the 1800s, he, he admitted right off of the bat, that there was no fossil evidence to support his contention that 
one species gradually changed into another. He recognized that if this had really happened, there would be countless transitional links or fossils of ancient animals that, that fill these gaps between the species. For instance, if fish really did climb out of the ocean and turn into amphibians, then there would be lots of fossils of transitional animals that were part fish, part amphibian. And Darwin said, the lack of these fossils is perhaps the most obvious and serious objection which can be argued against my theory. But Darwin thought that people will continue to, to look for fossils and unearth fossils. And he felt very strongly that as they did, they would indeed find these tr transitional links and his theory would be vindicated. Now you fast forward to modern times and you listen to Dr. Stephen J. Gould, a leading evolutionist and professor of biology and geology with Harvard University, quote, 120 years of fossil research after Darwin, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions. A species does not arise gradually by the gradual transformation of its ancestors. Check it out for yourself. Go, go to the Des Moines Public Library, check out a book on paleontology, and you can look at the unexplained gaps in the evolutionary charts. The, the fossil charts of evolutionists is, is based on imagination. It's not based on facts. It's amazing that evolutionists believe that it took 100 million years for animals without backbones to develop into animals with backbones. But there is not a single transitional fossil that has been found despite this tremendous lapse of time. What do the millions of fossils that have been found, what do they actually show? Well, there is the sudden appearance of all, nearly, the animal phyla, which appear fully formed, unchanged, to the present day. And without any record of ancestors before them or transitions after them, regardless of what kind of early primate they discover in a cave in Africa. What, what do you think the evidence supports? Doesn't the evidence sound a whole lot more like creation than it does evolution? Of course it does. Look, look at the, the screen here. This is a satellite dish. Since the year 1960, there has been concentrated efforts by the United States government and private scientific groups to point satellite dishes toward the sky in a search for extraterrestrial life. One project scans eight million radio channels listening for signals from space. Now, what are they listening for? Normally, satellite dishes merely receive static from space, but as the late astronomer Carl Sagan pointed out, all they need to receive, in his words, is just a single message from space. And if they were to get a, a single message from space, they would know for a fact that there is intelligent life out there. Why would they know it for a fact? Because they would instantly know that random static could not accidentally form a single sentence by chance. The odds would be too astronomical. So just one sentence would conclusively prove that there is intelligence out there because information requires intelligence behind it. Are you, are you following me on this? If you got a message from space, wouldn't it convince you that there is intelligence out there? Well, we have received a message from space. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And that Word was Jesus, and he came from the farthest reaches of intelligence to us here on this pale blue dot we call 
earth. He came to let us know not simply that there is a God, but the one true God who is creator and designer of all life longs to be in relationship with us. That is an amazing, powerful truth. Now, I want to have a little bit of a dialogue because uh, that was more of a, a preaching sermon to you. And I want to give some time as, uh, as we kind of uh, spend the rest of our time together, just, just talking a little bit. Because this issue is something that, as I said earlier and alluded to in this, in this topic, this is something that everybody assumes. Everybody takes for granted. In fact, when you begin to question evolution in the academic realm, you are so marginalized um, and stereotyped for being a kook that uh, you can't really even have a hearing. So I want to just intellectually try to work through a little bit of this with you. And I want you to think about some of the things that I brought up tonight. I gave you quite a few facts and figures, but I want you to think about two things, okay? Evolution, and imagine, you know, as we describe macroevolution, macroevolution is this process which takes one species into another species, and maybe even, say, in this species as it's developing into something else. Imagine birds, before they were birds, they weren't a bird. They were something else. So an animal that had limbs and its limb needed to become a wing to be able to fly. Before an animal could fly, it wasn't a flying animal. So it had to evolve these wings. So remember the process of natural selection. These are the principles they say is how it works. This is how they say it works. It means that an animal becomes stronger. It becomes more fit. That's how it survives. So to become stronger, to become more fit, an animal to get a wing to be able to fly above its predators and escape being a prey. It would have to go through this process of losing the use of its forelimbs for millions of years. It wouldn't be able to climb. It wouldn't be able to walk or run. It would just have to wallow around on the ground on its hind legs, basically, and at some point, the, the limbs on its side would have to stretch so that it could move them in such a way that it could get forced. But how many millions of years would it take for these, these arms to, to, to come in and develop into wings that actually worked? Doesn't it make sense that the animal would be eradicated before it could even get a chance to develop this thing that made it fit to survive? Think about the eyeball. Imagine, if you can, one-third of an eyeball. What does that look like? How would, and this is an unguided, random process, how would an animal that does not see know that it would be at, to its advantage to be able to see? And how would it then, over time, begin to develop these eyes? Did a scale just kind of begin to grow into itself and that scale begin to become gelatinous in some way that it began to be able to have photosynthesis, you know, kind of like light sensitivity. I, I, I don't know. How did that whole process work? And, and how many millions of years did it take for an eye to actually develop into a working eye ball? None of this makes sense when you begin to think through the process logically. Just the mere fact of, of the, the, the presence of a wing and the presence of eyeballs for me is the greatest argument against evolution that we know. 